Good morning, students. Bio 102, Lecture 7. Oh, we're moving along, aren't we? We're halfway through. We're on reproduction today, and we're going to look at different ways of reproduction in living organisms. This is fascinating. Um, why do we reproduce? So uh, a population outlives its members only by reproduction, the generation of new individuals from all existing ones. So um, what is reproduction? It's just the generation of new individuals from the ones that are already here. Two types of reproduction, there are two types of reproduction, asexual and sexual. So um, when the idea formed that we should um, generate new individuals from existing ones, um, there were two ways to go about it. And um, there was a fork in the road and you had to pick which one you wanted to pick to do, asexual or sexual. Asexual reproduction is the easiest kind. It is the generation of new individuals from your own self. So it's actually a form of immortality um, and non-senescence where you never really do get old because there's always a part of you that is now um, somewhere else because you divide into two and then uh, each part, each of those two divide into two and then more and more and more of those divide into more and more. And then um, the original one that started it all out is actually one of the same. So um, you never ever really do die. And asexual reproduction in, re in vertebrates occurs by these three different methods called fission, budding, and fragmentation with regeneration. So we're going to look at those. Um, but before we look at those, let's look at the advantages. Why did we choose uh, sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction? Why was this fork in the road? And why did we decide to go, uh, animals decide to go this way or that way? Well, asexual reproduction has a lot of very short-term benefits. It allows for rapid growth. The only problem is it needs a stable environment. Um, and once you have that stable environment, the organism can prolif proliferate immensely. So you could basically just keep on growing and growing and growing and growing. As long as there's food and as long as there's uh, the environment stays the same, you're the dominant life form. But the minute the, the, the food runs out or the environment changes or something in the temperature changes or something goes off, and then parts of you will start to die off in that particular area. And then you might just end up with fewer of you. Um, you might end up with like one left of you. So um, there are uh, a lot of uh, benefits because you can quickly take over the world uh, as long as there's food. But the minute something happens, then uh, things are not so good. So um, that's the choice you have to make. Uh, or you could go the sexual reproduction route, which gives a net advantage to that species by permitting a rapid generation of genetic diversity and allowing adaptation to changing environments. So um, the here, you have a lot of diversity. And if you have a lot of diversity, so if the food goes away or becomes different or the environment changes, well, you know what? The species will live on because there's going to be at least one person who doesn't mind eating yucky food or um, the hot environment or the freezing cold, and um, they will continue. So the species will continue. So uh, there is uh, something to be said for both types of reproduction. And uh, who's to say it's right or wrong? It's just a matter of choice. So let's look at asexual reproduction. And um, we did say there were three ways of doing it. Um, and let's look at binary fission, which is the first way we, we talked about. Binary fission is simply splitting that individual into two. It's a separation of a parent into two approximately equal sized individuals. And this occurs in both eukaryotes, like paramecium, hydra, euplotes, sea anemones, See, anemones are multicellular, many plants and fungus, as well as prokaryotes, and which we would expect bacteria and archaea. And here are pictures. So um, on the top uh, left-hand side, you see sea anemones. So these are the sea anemones. And here is one caught red-handed in the actual act of splitting into two. Um, here is a paramecium caught in the act of splitting into two. 
uh, here are green algae, really pretty green algae. And uh, they're uh, duplicating every single part of them, every pretty part, um, and making a, an image, a mirror image of themselves. Um, and here are uh, protozoa, which are euplodes or ciliate protozoa, that they have little hairs. Um, uh, here is one that is uh, dividing into two, making an exact copy of himself. Um, you can also do asexual reproduction by budding, where new individuals arise from outgrowths of existing ones. For example, corals. That's how corals reproduce, and corals are animals. Uh, yeast, like Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, this is uh, also a very small animal, but um, it can it, it buds, uh, and that's how it reproduces. Hydra, which we've seen so many times, and sponges, they all do asexual reproduction by budding. Um, the advantage of this is that the localized area is intensely covered by the same individual. So one area which is good will be intensely covered. Uh, here is a picture of yeast. So here you have a yeast cell, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it will develop a bud. And so you have a bud and then the bud will develop another bud and you get a whole chain of buds. So all of a sudden the yeast cell which was just in this area now is gonna take a bigger area. Here are corals. Um, so you have one coral and it'll bud and you get all these uh, side branches. Here is a hydra and it is budding into a complete individual um, at this junction. Um, here are more pictures of corals at the bottom. So that's just showing you budding. Uh, you can also have asexual reproduction as fragmentation with regeneration. Here it is a two-step step process. First, one part of the organism has to break off. Then both parts of the organism have to regenerate the missing parts. So uh, a lot of um, animals do this, uh, like sea squirts and sponges and bristle worms and annelid worms, and even planaria, which we uh, used in high school. So here is a planaria, and you can cut him up in uh, this way, or you can cut him up this way, or whichever way you want. But it will generate uh, all the missing parts, and you get um, um, all of the individual back. Here is a sea star, and he, one of his uh, legs fell off, so he regenerated one of them. But the leg that fell off is actually, as you can see, generating all the other parts, too. Um, here is a sea squirt, and uh, that's a bristle worm, and, they, and this is what they look like. They're not caught in the act of uh, uh, fragmentation with regeneration. I just brought pictures to show you what they actually look like. Asexual reproduction can also occur by something called parthenogenesis. And parthenogenesis means um, th there's actually an egg, uh, it's never fertilized, but yet it manages to grow into a full-fledged individual. All right, um, the full-fledged individual is not fertile, but it looks perfectly full-fledged. So that happens in invertebrates like bees and wasps even ants, and uh, the individuals are haploid. They only have half uh, the genome or half the set of uh, genes or chromosomes um, that they should have had. So like male honeybees uh, are, are drones and they are haploid individuals, but that's asexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, um, uh, this is very complicated. So the number of the offspring will stay the same because two individuals are required to produce offspring. So um, you have to produce two um, to m make one copy of yourself. So uh, this, this won't increase the population so much, um, but it will increase diversity. There are also a lot of problems and uh, there are difficulties in finding a mate to produce offspring. And that also reduces the chance of, uh, of flourishing or taking over the in, uh, colonizing the entire area. So th these are some problems of sexual reproduction. We're going to look at them in detail in a minute. But the benefits are long term. They're, they're very long term um, because genetic diversity is preserved, which allows for adaptation to changing environments. So here is a, um, a picture showing you um, asexual reproduction. So you can have, you know, it could be a female or a male. It actually has no gender. 
And, you know, very soon in four generations from that one, you get um, eight individuals um, in, in just four generations, which is kind of cool. Uh, whereas in sexual reproduction, uh, well, if you have a female, you got to go get a final male first, and um, then you can produce um, offspring. But if the offspring is female or male, then you have to go find another mate. And then, you know, so this problem goes on. So sexual reproduction uh, doesn't really allow a lot of uh, uh, crowding um, because of difficulties. Um, and so theoretically, the uh, it should keep pace with uh, the amount of food in the environment. So um, this should be good, whereas asexual reproduction will quickly outpace its um, food source. There's also in sexual reproduction something called hermaphroditism. So this is when um, uh, it is sexual reproduction. There are distinct genders. So one of the species is a female and one is a male. But um, again, the problem of finding a mate uh, is uh, pretty intensive. And so for some animals, finding a partner for sexual reproduction could be very challenging. And so one solution is hermaphroditism, in which each individual has male and female parts. Um, so two hermaphrodites can mate, and sometimes her hermaphrodites can self-fertilize. Um, hermaphroditism is an adaptation of sexual reproduction in response to the stress of not being able to find a mate. Um, hermaphrodites are sexually dimorphic individuals that carry both male and female reproduction, reproductive systems, and they're usually invertebrates like snails or slugs, plants, some fish even are hermaphrodites. Uh, dites. Uh, the benefits. What are the benefits of doing this? Well, um, if you're sessile, if you're an animal, or if you're a plant and you're sessile, which means you can't move around, you have very limited chances of finding a mate. Um, if you're a burrowing animal, you have very limited success in finding a mate because you're just digging around in the dirt. Uh, when are you going to see another mate? That's going to be really hard. So therefore, hermaphroditism enhances reproductive success, which means that it's sort of like a bridge between both worlds. Um, it's not asexual, it's not sexual, it's kind of in between um, because it's the same individual but it's producing diversity at the same time. So the hermaphrodites pr probably think, hey, we got it made in the shade, we don't have any problems, um, we can uh, do diversity and we can, we can uh, do everything on our own. The variations of hermaphroditism, let's look at them. Some individuals, um, well, some uh, species undergo sex reversals. This is very energy intensive and they can't really do this many times in their life cycles. Um, so they will be born one gender and then at some point due to some reason, they will reverse the gender. Um, some species exhibit male to female reversal like oysters. Um, others exhibit female to male reversal, for example, a coral reef fish that we're going to look at, um, but they don't do it too many times in one life cycle. Hermaphrodites can be sequential or simultaneous. So sequential hermaphrodites are those that are born as one gender but change to another later in life due to social structures. And there are three types of sequential hermaphrodites. So there's potandry, Protrandry is uh, you're born as a male, but you change to a female later in life, and the example is uh, a clownfish. Now I'll show you a picture in a minute. Or pr uh, protogony, uh, the individual is born as a female, but later changes into a male, for example, parrotfish or wrasses. We're going to look at those fishes in a minute. And then there are bidirectional sex changes, uh, where the individual is both female and male at different parts of its life. Um, these are the ones that change back and forth. Uh, the blue banded goby, um, some oysters, damselfish, and sea basses. So at certain t uh, time of their life, they can become a female, and then later they change to a male and then back. 
So here are sequential hermaphrodites. Um, so that is protandry. Um, this is the clownfish we looked at first. Um, they're born as uh, males and become females. And this is protogony. They're born as females and uh, become males later in life. And this is bidirectional. Um, they're um, born um, either way and they change uh, during their uh, lifespan. Um, so let's look at the sequential hermaphrodites. In prot protandry, um, the colony has one large female clownfish, and there's one smaller reproductive male, and a bunch of other smaller non-reproductive male. But if the female is removed, um, that reproductive male, the little guy over here, um, he will then um, change his gender and um, he will become, uh, he will mature and, um, and become a female. And then these little smaller non-reproductive males that weren't reproductive at all will suddenly mature and become reproductive and become his consort. So um, uh, this is how the colony would continue. That's protandry, uh, where the male becomes a female. In protogony, and the colony has male, uh, one male with many females, and female mimics. And um, then, if this one male disappears, uh, runs away, or is eaten, then the most dominant female will then uh, replace that male um, and uh, become a male. And that's protogony. So, uh, in the bidirectional hermaphrodites, like the blue banded goby it changes gender several times according to its social status, rega regardless of its initial gender, based on a simple principle. And the principle is, if the fish expresses subordinate behavior, then it changes its gender to male. And so these are all uh, fishes that live in, in uh, colonies. But if the fish expresses dominant behavior, then the fish changes its gender to female. So this happens um, pretty frequently in, in uh, this colony. Um, there are simultaneous hermaphrodites, so sequential where you got to be one and then you got to change to another. Um, but there are simultaneous hermaphrodites, so can't be bothered with that kind of stuff. So um, they are born with both fully functional reproductive organs of both genders. And so take care of the problem right away. Uh, usually they self-fertilize. And uh, here is the fish that we talked about that uh, is a simultaneous hermaphrodite. Um, it's a hamlet. And most uh, earthworms, snails, slugs, um, and flowers are hermaphrodites too. You don't think of flowers as anything but being pretty, but they are. There's two types of fertilization. Um, since we're now talking about sexual reproduction and fertilization, um, there's something called allogamy, where the fertilization of the egg of one individual is done with the sperm of another individual. So that's sexual reproduction with allogam, that's allogamous. But uh, you could have uh, autogamy or autogamy, which is self-fertilization, which occurs in hermaphrodites, where both the gametes are from the same individual. All right, um, uh, once uh, we have established, we've, so now we've done asexual, we've done um, uh, sexual with the borderline sexual, which is hermaphroditism, but now we're going to look at full-fledged sexual reproduction. Um, and here, uh, we start with all the problems. So there are many steps to sexual reproduction, and you start out with fertilization. So one egg has to be fertilized by one um, sperm. The fertilization can be internal, or it could be external. But either way, the environment has to be moist. So um, to get around this problem, uh, sometimes if the animal wants to do external fertilization, it could be synchronous, where populations uh, uh, get together and uh, the individuals will release gametes at the same time, and that's usually known as spawning. We see that uh, in fishes or in uh, amphibians. We could have asynchronous fertilization, um, and that uh, that is in higher individuals where um, there then requires more complicated stuff afterwards, like courtship among individuals, which confers benefits like selection and um, then immediate fertilization. 
whereas uh, if it's synchronous, um, there is no selection. There is just uh, um, fertilization randomly. If the, the fertilization is internal, it ref results in fewer gametes, but a higher fraction of those um, zygotes will actually survive. And these zygotes are going to be protected, protected against predators and water loss and physical damage. So internal fertilization is actually a good way to go um, because um, the uh, um, end product is uh, more likely to survive. For species with internal fertilization, there is great variation in the development stage at which offspring are released. Um, you could have uh, the egg released right away after fertilization as a fertilized egg. Or you could release the egg after it's become a little larva. So a little bit uh, is internal, but most of it is external. Or you could release the egg as a juvenile. So it's gone through the egg stage and the larva stage, and now it's a very small adult, but still needs some protection. But you know, you let it go. Or um, you could even uh, do it uh, as a sexually mature adult. You keep the, the uh, offspring inside, and you protect it until it's sexually mature and able to produce its own children, and then you let it go. And so let's look at protection after birth. Internal fertilization can result in zygotes being born with shells, okay, so like in birds or in reptiles. Um, or, if not a shell, um, with a gelatinous coat, as in fishes and amphibians. Their eggs are coated with uh, sticky stuff. Or, the embryos can be retained in the reproductive tract, as in marsupials. These would be uh, kangaroos. Or mammals, uh, where they're kept in there. And sharks do that too, and some fishes do that. So, um, you could just keep the embryo in the reproductive tract until it's a little bit more developed before you send it out. Um, parental care is usually present after birth in um, uh, internal fertilization. So, birds will feed their young, like penguins and eagles and so on. They usually feed their young, and mammals will usually nurse their offspring. Reproduction is generally cyclic, um, and it's of varying duration. Some bony fishes spawn several times a year, so they produce a lot of uh, sexually diverse um, individuals. Many bony fishes reproduce once a year until they die. So they keep on doing it, um, but only once. And then when they die, they die. Other bony fishes may reproduce only once during their entire lifetime, like the salmon. And the Pacific salmon reproduce only one uh, once in their five-year lifespan, and then they die. So they're born in fresh water, they migrate, uh, have a good time in the sea. Uh, when they're ready to die, they come back to the fresh water, um, lay their eggs, and, uh, and die. Um, factors affecting reproduction. Let's see. So um, changes in the duration of sunlight, which is also known as the photoperiod, can stimulate the beginning of reproduction. So if there's a lot of sunlight, um, that's usually a signal that there's probably plenty of food. So that uh, could stimulate the beginning of reproduction. Temperature changes can uh, trigger breeding in temperate and subpolar regions. So again, if the temperature gets more favorable, it'll be a good idea to reproduce now. Uh, or the presence of the opposite sex, that might affect reproduction. Or currents, they they are uh, in they influence reproduction. Or tides, or the stages of the moon, um, they also affect uh, when to spawn and things like that. And uh, presence of a suitable area is very important for um, affecting reproduction rates. Um, for example, diadromous fishes must have access to both marine and freshwater system to complete their life cycle. So right now, the uh, salmon are dying because in California, as they try to come back from the uh, Pacific Ocean um, to the rivers, the rivers have been dammed, um, or the, the water uh, is so, um, there's uh, this big drought in California, so the water isn't deep enough in the rivers, and they need, uh, you know, enough inches of water to swim in. And if there's not enough inches, if the river is now a trickle, um, they can't, they don't have the suitable area to complete their life cycle. So um, these are all factors that affect reproduction. Um, there are also uh, other things that will create reproductive isolation. 
So there's a collection of mechanisms, behaviors, and physiological processes that prevent the members of two different species to cross mate um, or any inf offspring is infertile. So um, there's a deliberate attempt to keep the species separate. These barriers, barriers maintain the integrity of a species over time, reducing or directly impeding gene flow between individuals of different species and allowing the conservation of each species' characteristics. So you don't want, for instance, a butterfly mating with a donkey or something like that. Um, that's not allowed. So those the barriers are present. Um, barriers can be prezygotic, so this will be before fertilization, or postzygotic, so this is after fertilization has already happened between the wrong species. So uh, in prezygotic uh, barriers, so this is prezygotic isolation, uh, these mechanisms are the most economic in terms of biological effic efficiency as resources are not wasted on the production of a descendant that's weak or non-viable or sterile. So you don't want something to, you know, start spend all this energy producing it and then discover, well, it didn't really work. So uh, we need to cut it off, head it off at the past so that this doesn't go on. And so uh, there are many uh, mechanisms uh, for pre-zygotic isolation. One of them is temporal. So there's a difference in time of sexual maturity or flowering, like two toad species, one matures in the spring, the other matures in the summer, so they can interbreed. Uh, or two flowering species, they might flower at different times during the year, so they can not interbreed even though they might be the same flower. Um, there could be a, a barrier that's ecological, like two fish that are stickleback species. One lives all year round in fresh water, mainly in small streams, and the other species lives in the sea during the winter. So um, there's isolation because of ecology, so they're not there. Um, and then in the spring, they both migrate to river estuaries to reproduce, but the two populations are reproductively isolated due to the adaptations to distinct salt concentrations. So one species that lives in the sea uh, may come back, but uh, he's already been adapted to living in the sea, so they won't mate together either. Um, you could also have a habitat problem. Um, so for instance, you might have the same flower, but one um, might live in the shade and the other one might live in sunny areas, like the wandering Jew, which is depicted here. Um, so it's also called a spider wart. And uh, they won't mate because they live in different um, sunshine uh, areas. And there is also a behavioral prezygotic isolation barrier. Um, there are mating, mating rituals. Uh, so if the ritual is not followed exactly, uh, mating will not happen. There are songs, and the songs have to be sung in the right order. Um, the dances, there are dances, and the dances have to be done in the right sequence. Um, because they lead to recognition, uh, and if they're done in the wrong order, then there's reproductive isolation. So it's a really very demanding chain of behavior. If the ritual is off, the next stage doesn't follow. Um, there are pheromones, which are very highly specific identifying compounds, and they're usually short-range chemical signals, and they will help in uh, behavioral um, uh, breaking down the behavioral barriers, but um, uh, these are very, very um, time-consuming and uh, demanding um, behaviors. So here is um, a picture of a male peacock, um, and uh, he is at the end of his dance, and at the end of the dance, if the female is still around um, and accepts the dance, then he will unfurl his tail into that beautiful exhibition um, so mating can occur. And if you'd like to listen to a cicada song, I have one over here, and this is the mating song of a cicada. So please uh, press on the link, listen to it, and come back to me. I'm sorry I can't join you in this because the software does not allow me to. More prezygotic isolation barriers. Um, it could be mechanical, like the reproductive organs are just simply not compatible. They're the wrong size. Um, uh, insects have a very rigid exoskeleton or a carapace, so there has to be a lock and key mechanism to ensure complementary structures. Um, plants generally have co-evolved with their pollinators, so the transfer of pollen doesn't occur to the other species. So um, it could be just a mechanical problem that um, is, is not allowing uh, mating to occur. 
um, it, then the isolation barrier could be gamete and gametic. When spawning occurs, there's still barriers to, to reproduction because um, uh, if we look at sea urchins, um, the concentration of spermatocytes, which fertilizes 100% of the same species, is only able to fertilize about 1% of the ovules of another species of sea urchins, which are right there. This inability to produce hybrid offspring, despite the fact that the gametes are found at the same time in the same place, is due to gamete incompatibility. Um, so gametic isolation in plants, um, what will happen is uh, all these pollen are falling on top of a, uh, a plant um, and uh, the pollen tubes, only one will be allowed to uh, reach the uh, egg and fertilize it, um, the one that grows fastest. The others simply will not uh, be able to get there. If in spite of all these barriers, all this uh, stuff that has happened, mechanical and behavioral and all the things that we looked at, in spite of that, two different species do get to mate. Well, there are other uh, ways to stop the species mixing up, um, and those are post-zygotic isolation barriers. So you might get the egg fertilized, but it's not going to develop uh, as it's going to be non-viable. or if it is viable, because they're really closely related species, um, they just will grow up, but they will be sterile. So they still can't reproduce its own self. Um, so the gene flow is impeded. Here is the picture of a mule. So it is a hybrid of uh, two, two species of equus, which is horse. Um, it is the horse species, but um, it's a donkey and a... Uh, horse and what you end up with is uh, a mule and you don't get um, it to be uh, fertile because uh, one parent has 64 chromosomes and the other parent has 62 chromosomes and the uneven number of chromosomes um, doesn't allow any uh, gametes to form. Um, so uh, there are other ways uh, that postzygotic isolation is ensured. Either the sperm or the zygote does not survive in the female reproductive tract, so it's just killed off. The zygote may miss just one protein in 30 to form one pore, and the resulting pore may be defective. And so the zygote just won't ever develop um, by missing just one thing. Um, and that will uh, trigger hybrid necrosis um, because the other gamete is uh, recognized as pathogenic. And sometimes it isn't even the genetic component, but the cytoplasmic component, which results in an incompatibility by absence of a symbiont. So even the genetic component might just match up and be fine. But uh, because the cytoplasm is different, uh, you won't get um, uh, the, the uh, offspring because a symbiont is absent. Here is... Um, genetic drift. So here is a, um, a, a, something to show you that these are selective pressures. You start out with one population of these bugs and, um, and let's say they're, they're honeybees and they're light brown colored and uh, you, you start feeding one, half of them uh, dark honey and the other half very light colored food. Um, well, after a few generations, what you're going to see is um, the light-colored ones will just mate with themselves, and even when you put them together, they're no longer isolated. When you try to mate them together, they won't. Um, they just don't do it because by now um, the uh, genes have drifted, so they're no longer these brown-colored animals. Now they're distinct, different colored animals, so they won't. So let's look at a review of what we just studied in um, the difficulties of reproduction. Um, and uh, also, do remember from uh, Bio 101, we did talk about uh, meiosis and uh, the, the division of uh, the chromosomes of the genetic component. So in mitosis, remember, um, you have the full component of uh, the genes, and you could have... Uh, 
um, the males, uh, the sperm, going, undergoing mitotic divisions until finally it becomes a spermatocyte. And at that point, it's going to undergo meiosis and it will end up with haploid sperm. Um, and similarly, uh, you would have, uh, uh, so this is showing the same thing about spermatocytes and how they become sperm with uh, just uh, half of the chromosomal component. Um, and this is showing the same thing. This is also taken from your book. It's showing you um, all the divisions and where the various cells are located um, in uh, the uh, male of the species. Um, in the female of the species, what you have is, again, the same idea. Um, you have lots of um, stem egg cells. Um, they will just uh, complete, uh, completely do mitotic divisions until they start maturing and uh, then they undergo meiosis and you have uh, half of the cell, um, I'm sorry, half of the genetic component um, and you um, uh, produce eggs. Um, when these eggs are fertilized by the sperm, then uh, you get a fertilized egg because the genetic component goes and mixes with this and you get the entire gen genome back. And here you see the uh, two cycles uh, side by side where you see um, the half um, genetic component individuals of sperm and uh, eggs uh, getting together and forming a zygote or a fertilized egg. The differences between spermatogenesis and oogenesis, it's not that much. Spermatogenesis differs from oogenesis in three ways. Um, it's very subtle, but all four products of meiosis develop into sperm. Um, so that's, that's one thing, whereas only one of the four becomes an egg in females. Um, spermatogenesis occurs throughout ad ad uh, adolescence and adulthood and sperm are produced continu continuously without the prolonged interruptions in oogenesis. So um, this, um, these are the subtle differences between sper spermatogenesis and oogenesis, but the processes are the same. G genetic component is divided into half. Um, so uh, we're looking at the uh, negative feedback um, loops for um, spermatogenesis. Again, it's controlled by the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, which will produce FSH and LH, um, which uh, then um, uh, acts on the sperm and uh, produces uh, viable sperm. And then uh, you have uh, the same control in females, uh, again, by the anterior, anterior pituitary, by FSH and LH. Well, I hope this was helpful. It was a, a small review, um, and um, I will see you next time, students.